Good morning, welcome to Breakfast with Charlie States and Nagat Monchetti. Time now, 13 minutes past seven. We have had to start using a whole host of new words and phrases recently from herd immunity, self-isolation, of course, PPE. The latest one you'll be hearing a lot over the coming weeks and months is the R rate, which is the measurement of how rapidly COVID-19 is either spreading or dwindling. So, how does it work? Well, if the rate is one, that means that anybody infected is passing, is only passing to one other person. So effectively things are stable. But anything above one means the outbreak has accelerated. So if the rate is two, each infected person is passing it on to two others. So if you get to a rate of three, things are even worse. That's where we were a month ago. So at the moment, it's estimated the rate is between 0.6 and point nine, that's crucially below the line of one person infecting only one other. It's estimated by Imperial College that reopening schools, for example, could add about point two, but nobody can be sure. So allowing public gatherings again, what would that be? That would add 0 0.5. And if you put those all together, it's now taking us above the line of one. And scientists also say that relaxing the lockdown entirely would add two to the rate so it takes us back to the worst of the outbreak which is probably why uh, easing of the lockdown will be managed in careful is likely to be managed in very careful stages let's talk about this a little bit more with tom solomon who's a frontline doctor also director of the uk's emerging infections research unit also joined by david strudhart who is chair of the global health of Global Public Health of Edinburgh University. Very good morning to you both. I just wonder, um, Debbie, first of all, if I, I could start with you. Um, we heard in the press conference yesterday from Boris Johnson uh, those words, past the peak. Could you give us a sense of what that means in, in practical, in, in layman's terms? Well, I guess what he's referring to is that the UK, looking at the data so far, hopes that we're past any increase in daily new deaths, as well as increases in terms of, given the lag, daily new infections. And so the fear now, and this is why there's such concern over this, our number is actually about it increasing again, because we don't want to have is that we relax these, you know, measures that people go back to some kind of, you know, daily life. And then actually we see a creeping up of daily new cases, which means we have to lock down again at some point if we think NHS capacity will be breached. Um, yeah. So on the R rate, which people are, you know, we're all on a learning curve. These are things you know all about. We're on a learning curve here. The R rate, what are the cri critical factors there that w will be most relevant to whether it stays, increases or drops? Well, we've seen actually that the way to actually bring it under one, which is absolutely essential to make sure that we actually don't have exponential growth, is strict measures. And so right now it's trying to find the exact package of measures that allows us to stay underneath one. One potential way to do that is to have an aggressive test, trace, isolate strategy. So you start just removing those who are um, infected from the general population rather than having what we have now, kind of a general quarantine throughout. And so right now there's modeling being done, looking at potential scenarios. Um, all these are estimates um, and they're you know, expert guesses on what different opening measures um, could look like in terms of affecting that value. Um, Tom, let's pick up on that. You know, uh, the, the terms used there by Debbie were modelling, um, looking at modelling, looking at estimates, expert guesses. Where are we learning from? What are we looking at or what is science looking at in terms of what's happening around the world in order to effectively keep that R rate at one or below? Well, you have to remember this is a new, still a new virus. We only first heard about it at the end of December. So everything is new for this virus, but we do have experience from other outbreaks. And we know that, uh, for example, with this virus, when it was at its worst, the R number, the reproduction number was about three. So for every one person infected, they would infect three. And those three would then infect another three, which gives you nine and so on, 27, 81. So you can see how the outbreak grew very quickly. And now we've got this number below one, so that means uh, one person will, on average, infect less than one person, which means the outbreak's coming down, and, and that's what we're seeing. And we've discovered, what we have learned is that the way we got this R number down, the way we brought the outbreak under control, was by social isolation, principally. Uh, if everybody sits at home on their own, 
uh, then even if they are infected, there's not many people that they will pass it on to. And the critical question now is how do we ease some of these restrictions while still keeping this number below one? And it would, uh, I think the kind of things that will happen is that we will perhaps allow the schools to open up a bit more. We've shown that uh, it, within uh, sh um, food stores, uh, supermarkets, people can visit these and keep isolated, keep two metres apart, et cetera. And I imagine that some of those measures will then be used in other, other shops and other workplaces. So we, we're using what we've learned to keep the outbreak under control whilst also easing some of the restrictions. And also, Tom, of course, yesterday we heard in uh, the press conference at Downing Street, Boris Johnson laying out the groundwork, I suppose, and suggestions of what um, easing restrictions could involve and face coverings, masks were mentioned. How effective would those be and where? Where would they need to be worn? Well, the evidence on, on masks is very finely balanced. Clearly, if they had a big impact, uh, then we would, uh, everybody would be told to wear them all the time. It seems that there's a small impact and it's more if they're worn by somebody who is infected uh, and they're coughing and spluttering, it stops them passing the virus on to so many other people. So really, the, 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 you want that, that's the only solid evidence. But I think there's also a feeling that there's no, probably no harm in others wearing a mask if, if they uh, find it reassuring. I don't think there'll be any strong uh, re le legislation to say you have to wear a mask because the, the evidence just isn't there at the moment. Um, the other thing I would come back to is we, we, we talked about what measures might help us come out of the lockdown. And I think one of the really exciting things, if we can get it to work, is this idea that uh, we will use Bluetooth technologies in phones uh, so that people can enable their phones with an app uh, that will uh, let you know during the day who you've come in contact with. <clears throat> and then if somebody discovers that they have been infected with the virus, they'll be able to send a message automatically to everyone who's been near them without actually uh, no names, nobody, all, all you'll know is you'll just get a message that will say sometime during the day you may have been close to somebody who's now proved positive and that will then be a trigger for me if I get that message to go and get tested myself. Those technologies you asked about other countries, those technologies have proved really effective in Asia and if we can get something like that working in this country I think that'll be really useful. Professor Shridhar, I just want to pick up on a couple of things. I saw you nodding in relation to the uh, face masks a moment ago. And also, there are a number of reports about um, that children do not transmit the virus. There's been quite a lot of research into this. It becomes more relevant now as we're expecting some kind of development in connection with how schools might reopen. No dates, of course, but how that might happen. So what's the evidence there and how might face masks play into that? Yeah, so children have been one of the areas that, of course, there's been lots of interest into. And I think what's clear, there was a large study out yesterday from Germany that children can carry the virus. So I think there's generally consensus that, you know, children, there was questions to start, can children actually carry the virus? They can. And the next question is actually, are they shedding um, enough of it to infect other people? And it seems like there, at least from looking at, you know, contact tracing, which is going back and seeing who could have been infected by others, that they found very few cases of actually children infecting adults. Um, and this, of course, plays an important decision in schools because we've seen that the effects on children are um, quite small. They generally have mild symptoms. And so the, the worries, of course, on their parents or anyone they're living with, as well as passing it on to their teachers or those in their kind of educational community. And so this is a crucial question to really nail down. But the cost of getting it wrong is very high. So I think it's very you know, smart right now to be cautious. It's a new virus. We don't fully understand um, everything about it. Just to kind of get absolute, probably not absolute certainty, but as close as we can to a good enough feeling of actually how much could opening schools affect this R number, because the worst thing to do would be to open schools and then see you know, this triggering um, a large increase in that, and then we having to take more drastic measures to actually pull back. Tom, um, um, li listening to what David Schrader was saying there, I mean, I, I, we're hearing that Switzerland has said it's um, children under 10 can safely hug their grandparents. Now, we're very mindful here on BBC Breakfast of the of following the advice that the government is laying out and the science is telling us as well. Um, but any grandparents and grandchildren hearing that today, they'd be encouraged by that. Is, is that right? Well, I, I think that, that, that there are different data suggesting different things. And I think our approach in this country is to be cautious until we know things are absolutely safe. And, and as Debbie was saying, the, the data 
There are new studies coming out about children's role in, in becoming infected and passing the virus on. And at this stage, uh, it's not completely clear that it is safe for children to hug their grandparents. So for that reason, uh, my children will be staying away from their grandparents uh, until we know otherwise. But I, I think, I mean, it has been a, you know, a fascinating time in many ways. There's so much data coming out. There's so much interest from the public in the science, which I think is, is, is really one of the positive things. Um, I would never have imagined in my career that we'd end up discussing what R means on, on BBC Britain. Now, I think all of these things does mean that people are trying to understand and get a better understanding of, of the science behind some of the decisions which are made. And these are very difficult and nuanced decisions. And, and I think it's helpful for people to understand how, how tough some of the decisions are. Tom, thank you very much. Tom Solomon from the University of Liverpool and Professor Shridhar, thank you very much for your time this morning. Both, I'm sure we'll talk again at, at another day. Thank you.